Hello, uh, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, this is one of the uh, kind of, um, several uh, panel discussions put together by Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy at the Ford School here. Uh, my name is Brian Jacob. I'm a faculty member at the Ford School and director of Close Up. Uh, so I have the very onerous task of thanking various people and introducing the moderator. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Tom Buckmuller and Matt Davis, uh, the faculty who have uh, pulled together the substantive part of this panel. Um, uh, Matt Davis is an associate professor at the medical school and at the Ford School of Public Policy. And Tom Buckmuller is a, a, the Walter Walt, Waldo O. Hillebrand Professor of Risk Management Insurance uh, at the Business School. That's a mouthful. Um, and I also thank uh, Tom Avaco and Bonnie Roberts for pulling together the logistics for the event. Um, I'd also like to note that this uh, event today is co-sponsored uh, with between Close Up and the Ford School, uh, and in particular it has support of the Ford School's Gilbert Gilbert Omen and Martha Darling Health Policy Fund. I see Martha is here with us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and so I guess without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who will introduce the speakers, and then we'll proceed with the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks for organizing this. Uh, we did something like this last year. Um, almost exactly a year ago, which turned out to be, I believe, the day after or a couple days after the health care reform bill was signed. Um, and I was a speaker, and it was really difficult to prepare because even leading up to the last day, uh, it wasn't clear if there was going to be a bill, if we were going to be talking about what went wrong, talking about what next. Um, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of confusion, uh, a lot of heated rhetoric in the, in the media. Um, so now we're at the one-year anniversary. Uh, if you feel like there's still a lot of confusion, uh, a lot of heated rhetoric, a lot of uncertainty, um, you're not alone. But um, we've got three excellent speakers that are going to provide some insights and, and hopefully some clarity. Um, as you know, healthcare reform is a huge topic. Uh, we, could, we could do a couple day workshop on it, so we had to really focus um, to, to, uh, to fit it into the time frame. And so given uh, this is sponsored by Close Up, we thought we would focus on what is going on at the state level. So our three speakers are going to talk about different aspects of how uh, healthcare is being uh, implemented and, and litigated um, at the state level. So the first speaker um, is Jenny Kenny, who's a health economist at the Urban Institute in Washington, uh, an alumnus of, of the University of Michigan. She received her PhD here. Jenny is a health economist who is a, a specialist in the area of Medicaid and state policy. And so she's going to give us a sense of what different states are, are doing and what are sort of the, the big issues as, as states try to, to grapple with their new role. Looking a little bit more local, we have Chris Priest, uh, who comes from Lansing, who is the uh, Deputy Medicaid Director and sort of a, a point man on health care reform. So he's involved with all aspects of, of uh, getting health care reform moving, setting up exchanges, thinking about subsidies, and so on. Um, so he's going to bring the discussion of implementation uh, a little closer to home. And then our final speaker is Nick Bagley, who's an assistant professor of the law school, um, is going to talk about the legal issues surrounding health care reform. Um, what is the current state of, of the lawsuits and, and uh, some thoughts about where this might go and, and what it means for the future of the bill. So I'm going to get out of the way and let them talk. Um, one uh, uh, procedural thing, what we're going to do for questions, um, you'll notice that there are um, little cards and pencils um, on both sides of each row. If, if as the, one of the speakers is speaking, a question occurs to you, um, write it down. What we're going to do is we're going to take all the questions at the end, and, and Matt and Bonnie will collect <coughs> the cards um, and bring them to me. Uh, we're videotaping, and that way we can make sure that, that all the questions are, are read aloud, and, and, um, and then whoever on the panel wants to take the questions will we'll handle it. So uh, we'll start with Jenny. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. I was going to start by briefly describing the fe key features of the Affordable Care Act. 
uh, that relate to insurance coverage. Um, but we'll focus most of my talk, as Tom said, on the Medicaid pieces of the law. Um, as, uh, as, as probably most of you know, um, there's a substantial Medicaid expansion uh, that's part of the law. Um, and um, it will greatly expand affordable coverage to poor and near poor um, adults uh, below 133% of the federal poverty level um, with at the exclusion of undocumented immigrants and immigrants who've been in the country for less than five years. Second, the law includes uh, the creation of state-based ex uh, exchanges uh, and uh, a number of health insurance market reforms uh, that include uh, guaranteed issue, uh, the absence of uh, limits uh, related to pre-existing uh, health conditions, uh, the uh, exclusion um, of lifetime um, and annual uh, maximum uh, spending limits, uh, and uh, that uh, regulate premiums um, and only allow for um, premium variation uh, with respect to age and smoking status and limit the extent of variation. Uh, third, um, the law includes new subsidies uh, for health insurance coverage for those uh, with incomes between 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level uh, and cost sharing uh, subsidies uh, for those uh, up to 250% of the federal poverty level. Uh, fourth, and you're gonna hear a lot more about this from Chris, uh, the law requires uh, that Medicaid coverage be coordinated with exchange coverage uh, and includes other uh, kind of requirements related to enrollment, um, including uh, uh, the streamlining of enrollment systems, uh, the provision of one-stop shopping for exchange and me Medicaid coverage, um, the, uh, a single application form, and to the extent possible, the use of data matching uh, to uh, determine eligibility for Medicaid and subsidies. Uh, there are new employer requirements, uh, which I won't talk about. And then finally, and you'll hear a lot about this from the third speaker, uh, but very importantly, uh, the law includes uh, an individual requirement uh, to ob obtain health insurance coverage um, that involves penalties uh, for noncompliance. Um, and um, penalties uh, graduate uh, in terms of um, the, the cost uh, from 214 up to 216. Um, and certain groups are exempted from, uh, from the mandate. But as I said, um, I want to focus on the Medicaid piece. Well, first, uh, what do we expect uh, the law uh, to accomplish in terms of changing uh, insurance coverage in this country? Um, these are CBO estimates. Uh, they're very similar to a number of different estimates that have been made by other groups. Uh, and basically, um, the expectation is that the uninsured in this country will drop from about one in five uh, to fewer than one in 10. And while there's disagreement on the ESI effects or the effects on employer-sponsored coverage, um, uh, CBO and a number of other analyses uh, project uh, that the Affordable Care Act will have very little effect on the share of the population that gets its cover through uh, an employer. Uh, the reliance on Medicaid is expected to grow substantially uh, from about 13 to 18 percent of the population uh, with uh, uh, an increase of about 16 million uh, Medicaid enrollees projected. And um, the population receiving uh, coverage through private non-group um, uh, is projected to increase uh, also substantially from 10 to 17 percent, with most of that new coverage coming uh, through these uh, health insurance exchanges. Well, who are the folks uh, we expect to have um, uh, remaining uninsured after reform? Notwithstanding the large increase in Medicaid enrollment that's projected, uh, the CBO projects that about 40%, four in 10 of the remaining uninsured, will actually be eligible for Medicaid or CHIP but not enrolled. About a quarter are projected to be undocumented immigrants. Uh, a little over a quarter are projected uh, to be bound by the mandate, um, which means they'll be facing penalties for noncompliance. 
and about 8% uh, are, ex are expected to be exempt from the mandate. Um, as I said, there are exemptions. Um, so the Medicaid eligibility expansion is um, a pillar of, of this reform uh, bill. Uh, as I said, uh, the expansion raises to 133% of the federal poverty level uh, eligibility threshold uh, for uh, non-immigrants uh, in this country. De facto, that's about 138% of the federal poverty level because a standard uh, disregard is applied. Um, no longer will there be assets tests uh, for, for eligibility for Medicaid. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, because of the current uh, very generous coverage for children in this country. Most of the new Medicaid enrollees are projected to be adults. Um, there will be some transfer of children from Medicaid, uh, from uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program into Medicaid, uh, but beyond that, the future of the Children's Health Insurance Program is uncertain. Um, importantly, uh, the law requires, um, with uh, exceptions for a, f a small subset of states, that between now and 2014, when the major provisions of uh, the bill are, um, or the law are, are scheduled to be implemented, uh, that states maintain their eligibility uh, their, uh, for Medicaid as of uh, what it was in, in March uh, 2010 uh, when the, the law was signed, um, and their enrollment procedures. Um, so um, in the meanwhile, states are, are programs are, are really frozen in place to a large extent in terms of eligibility. Um, the law includes a very different matching rate contributions uh, to state Medicaid programs uh, that vary uh, with the type of eligibility group in question, that vary across years as the uh, law is implemented over time and across states. Um, the core groups who are already eligible for coverage, like um, children uh, and very low-income parents um, uh, will be um, supported with federal funds that are the standard federal matching contribution to state programs. Um, right now, the, at the minimum, states receive a dollar uh, federal funds for each dollar of state funds that they um, spend on Medicaid. Um, and all the way up to uh, a state like Mississippi and, and the poorest states uh, putting in much a smaller fraction of, of the total Medicaid costs. In contrast, these groups that were newly made eligible uh, by um, under the bill, uh, specifically the childless adults, um, will um, be fully federally financed in the initial period. Um, and uh, the lowest federal uh, matching uh, contribution toward their care will be 90%. So it's an very small amount of state funds uh, that are going as a proportion of the total for these new newly eligible groups. Um, and of course, um, there's tremendous variation today in how um, states uh, cover what the state programs look like with respect to Medicaid eligibility. So that this, there's some provision to try to make whole the states that have already uh, expanded coverage uh, to parents and other adults. Um, by increasing their matching um, rates from the federal government over time. Uh, just to bring home um, the fact that currently, under current law, um, the uh, state, um, uh, there's tremendous variation across states in um, coverage of different types of uh, individuals. Um, the median state um, has an eligibility uh, threshold either under Medicaid or CHIP for kids that's well above 200% of the federal poverty level, whereas the median state covers no uh, childless adults. And those are adults who are um, not living with a, a child who's under 18. A lot of them are between 18 and 29 uh, per, uh, in age. Um, so this um, reflects uh, the um, sort of visually the fact that most of the new eligibles are going to be in this childless adult group or in the parent um, uh, groups. Um, a key factor that will affect how successful the Affordable Care Act is at reducing uninsurance in this country is the extent to which um, those who are eligible for Medicaid actually take up that coverage. 
this shows you what the CBO assumed in their standard um, uh, assumptions about uh, take-up rates under the Affordable Care Act. The first column shows you what they assume about the take-up rates among those who are already eligible. They assume there's some woodwork effect and that the mandate, while not directly applicable to most of the already eligible uh, enrollees, uh, might still increase their participation. Um, and um, higher participation rates are assumed among um, the newly eligible, and it's assumed that some of them will come for those from uh, those who already have coverage, those who have employer-sponsored coverage or non-group coverage, but the bulk are assumed to be coming from the uninsured. Um, the second um, column reflects um, what would be a, a much higher rates of take-up among these different groups. Um, to show that under the standard CBO scenario, uh, the projected increase in, in Medicaid enrollment, as I said, is 16 million, uh, and that's uh, associated with an 11 million decline in uninsurance uh, among um, folks in this country. With the higher participation rates, um, which actually um, are consistent with participation rates that some states have achieved, but they're, at the, they're outlier states, um, you could see Medicaid enrollment growing by 26 million. So there's substantial room for even more growth in Medicaid enrollment over and above uh, what is in the uh, core CBO assumptions. And that would have the consequence of further reducing the uninsurance uh, in this country uh, by another 9 million um, and, and really shrinking the pool uh, after reform. One of the big sources of debate uh, to which uh, Tom was alluding um, concerns the implications of the Affordable Care Act uh, on, for Medicaid spending. Um, the CBO projects under its standard participation rate assumptions um, that together federal and state uh, spending on Medicaid will rise uh, by over $460 billion over the 214 to 219 time period. Um, but the lion's share of that is projected uh, to be picked up by the federal government. And state Medicaid spending is projected to grow um, by 1.7% uh, uh, due to the Affordable Care Act relative to baseline. And even if states um, are able to achieve the high participation rates that were in, uh, consistent with that enhanced scenario, um, state Medicaid spending is projected to increase by just 4.4%. Um, and that's an increase uh, in Medicaid enrollment. That, so the, Medi the, state's Medicaid, the state Medicaid spending increases just 4.4%, while Medicaid enrollment is 44%. So um, there's a very small share of this cost, even for uh, really high Medicaid enrollment uh, growth. Uh, uh, is going to be um, coming from the state budgets. But as we all know, uh, the healthcare market is complex and changes in Medicaid spending are not the only source of potential increased costs for states or savings under the Affordable Care Act. Um, states uh, will experience higher administrative costs, likely for Medicaid, for running these exchanges, and down the road they're going to be responsible for more of those costs. Um, they're not going to receive as much in federal payments to disproportionate share uh, safety net hospitals. They may experience increases in costs um, uh, associated with their state employee benefit plans. But on the other side of the ledger, um, it's likely that they'll experience substantial savings in a number of areas. Um, right now, the state and local contribution to uncompensated care for the uninsured is, is, is uh, billions and billions of dollars. So that's one source of savings. Second, a number of states, as you could see from the earlier slide, uh, given that those were medians, um, are actually uh, covering pregnant women above 133% of the federal poverty level and other groups, and some of those groups will be able to shift into the exchange and get full federal funding for that, and, and the state won't be responsible for any state cover, uh, uh, costs. But another uh, really important source of potential savings, if the states can capture them, 
is um, related to the very large uh, state outlays on uh, mental health services right now. Um, so um, all in all, uh, most analyses suggest that the potential savings um, net of the new costs um, are, are, are large. Um, but of course, they vary across states. Um, and um, the map, this map will give you a sense uh, for how profoundly different uh, this uh, law will um, uh, affect Medicaid uh, programs across the country. The states uh, that are in the darkest um, color are ones where after reform uh, is fully implemented, um, over a quarter of their Medicaid enrollment is expected to be uh, in, the, uh, in these new groups. And then the states that are the lightest, uh, or the yellow, are states that have um, pretty small fractions of their uh, enrollment after reform uh, in these new groups. And in fact, um, a state like Texas is an outlier on one side that's expected to um, experience a 46% increase in their Medicaid enrollment um, with a 4% increase in, in state spending. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Massachusetts that's expected to uh, experienced just a 2.6% increase in their enrollment in Medicaid and actually expected to um, have to spend fewer state dollars uh, because of the federal dollars that will be coming in. So the other piece that I wanted to talk about um, that varies um, substantially across states um, is relates to um, a concern that Medicaid programs will not be ready to meet this increased demand in terms of the service delivery system. Um, the bill, the law includes increasing support, uh, uh, federal, federal support for community health centers to expand their base. Um, and it also includes funding uh, to support an increase in payment to primary care physicians for primary care services. It's uh, fully federally funded for just two years. Uh, so, and the idea of starting it in 2013 is that you build the base up and, and get uh, primary care providers more willing to serve um, Medicaid, um, uh, the Medicaid population. And as many of you know, participation in Medicaid is, is actually low in many areas of the country with just about half of all uh, physicians saying that they're willing to take new Medicaid uh, physicians. Um, so this is potentially um, you know, quite uh, a, a big increase in, and, um, in, in terms of reimbursement for primary care, but the fact that it's limited to just two years in terms of federal funding will, I think, create pressure on states perhaps to continue it, um, but also the real implementation challenges related to the fact that it has to be passed through to managed care. And at the current time, we really don't have public information about the payment rates uh, in managed care uh, plans. Um, and um, as with the eligibility expansions, this is going to have uh, very different types of effects across the country uh, because there are a number of states, about 11 states, currently pay at Medicare levels. Um, and then you have, at the other end of the spectrum, five states that are paying less than 60% of what Medicare pays. So let me close um, with, um, by emphasizing uh, what are the major challenges ahead uh, for states uh, with respect to implementation um, of the policies that are required to support this um, unprecedented Medicaid expansion. We really have nothing historically uh, that, that's uh, of this magnitude. Um, and to support the primary rate increases and the operation of the exchanges. Um, and to address what are um, really uh, likely pressing workforce uh, and supply issues. Um, and all that's happening um, uh, at a time when the states are going to be facing an even bigger financing crush, crunch uh, than, than they've lived through the last couple years. Uh, as I said, states are bound by the maintenance of effort requirement and the law to maintain their eligibility and enrollment processes. Um, but they're going to see uh, a decline in the federal contribution toward their Medicaid programs uh, this July 1. 
Um, and um, that combined with the sluggish uh, economic growth uh, that we're experiencing uh, is, is going to put, I think, even more calls for uh, greater flexibility in Medicaid before the major provisions of the bill are even um, implemented. So with that, I'll turn to Chris, uh, who's going to give you a picture of what this bill means for Michigan. Thanks. So this one's forward? Yep. Cool. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to talk a little bit from kind of an on-the-ground perspective. Um, a lot of what you've heard in the heated rhetoric in Washington and, you know, politics is, as, as kind of politics goes, you've heard a lot of rhetoric and a lot of information, but I kind of want to take a step back and show you from kind of a practical implementation perspective the challenges that we're facing here, right here in Michigan, to try to implement this law. So let me start off. As you can see here, I'm going to focus on just two things. I'm going to focus mainly on the, on the, um, the exchange and its relation to Medicaid. But look at all the other stuff that we've got to do. So we have a lot of things, and there's some stuff that we want to do, frankly. For example, um, contained and actually in the governor's budget this, this year is a, um, a proposal to integrate care for those who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. There are new FQHCs as a result of the law, like Jenny mentioned, that there's new dollars available to establish new FQHCs in the state. There are patient-centered medical home demonstrations, our funding for uncompensated care. So for example, the University of Michigan Health System gets a lot of dollars for uncompensated care for folks who come in without insurance. Well, as coverage increases, like Jenny was talking about with Medicaid and with more people getting private insurance, those dollars come down. So from a health system standpoint, University of Michigan, DMC, a lot of the systems around the state are going to have a shift in their financing. How does all this work? New fraud, waste, and abuse. The physician increase, that, that was, that's a very strong challenge, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But all of this, and not to mention all the public health demonstrations, all of this stuff together, you can't take it in a silo. You can't just say, here's the exchange, boom, implement it. Here's the Medicaid expansion, boom, implement it. Here's a patient-centered medical home, boom, implement it. If you're really going to address the cost drivers in the system and try to provide quality, affordable care for everybody, you've really got to do all of this together and break down those barriers, institutional within government, between providers and really bring folks together and try to, to, um, to negotiate and figure out a new solution. How do you make all this work? So that's kind of a lot of the challenge that we're facing. And I'm just going to focus on two things today that relate to each other. And I could sit here and wax poetically forever about all the rest of this stuff. But I'm going to focus just on a couple things today which will give you kind of a flavor for what we're dealing with at the state level. So just to give you some background of what we've done to date, uh, like Jenny was talking about, there is a maintenance of effort on Medicaid and CHIP. So for all intents and purposes, we cannot cut eligibility for those who are on Medicaid and the My Child program today. So that was evident in the governor's budget, and it's something that we are bound by for adults until 2014 and for kids until 2019. So there are three levers to really pull when you're reducing Medicaid costs, eligibility, rates, and benefits. The eligibility lever is frozen for us now. So if there's something that we wanted, if we had to cut Medicaid, really the two things that are left to us are benefits and rates. So that's the solution we have. So in this difficult budget time, those are kind of, that's kind of what we're, what we're working with. We've also established a high risk pool in Michigan. A high risk pool is for folks that have pre-existing conditions that have been uninsured for more than six months and they're a U.S. citizen, they're eligible to come and get a federally subsidized health care product to help treat, to, to basically to help get them coverage. And we, that's been, uh, it was established in October of last year, and the premiums are, are, are pretty high still. They're cheaper than you could probably find on the individual market, but they're still pretty high for a lot of folks who don't have health coverage. So you haven't seen a lot of take-up in that program yet. 
We have insurance market reforms, and this is the stuff you hear about in the media. The, if you're up to age 26, which I assume some of you are, you can stay on your parents' health plan until, um, until you reach that age. If you're a child, you can't be um, discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. If you're a cancer patient and you have um, huge costs as a result of the treatments, you can't have um, your coverage dropped because you hit a lifetime limit. Those types of things are now in effect. And then there are things that we continue to work on. That includes medical loss ratio, which is a very horrible way of, and horrible description, a way to, to basically say that you're spending a certain amount of money on health care and a certain amount of money on administration, marketing, et cetera. We have new rules for that in place. There's reinsurance programs. And then we, the states are being given new dollars to be able to review um, proposed rate increases by the insurance industry. So that's kind of where we are. But let me talk a little bit about the health insurance exchange, because really, in my opinion, this is kind of the shiny new thing of healthcare reform that a lot of folks are going to see on the ground. So basically, it's like a new marketplace where individuals and small businesses can go and purchase coverage. So it's an organized place where you have a choice of health plans, subsidies to purchase care, and kind of you know what you're getting. So this is a very simplified way, and some of the health policy experts here might disagree with me using this analogy. But the simplified way to think about what an exchange is, is how many folks have ever gone to purchase airfare through the site Orbitz? Anyone? So on Orbitz, you put in, I want to leave from Detroit to New York, and I have this many people, and I want to live on this date. And you push a button, and up comes US Airways, Delta, what, what have you. And then it says nonstop, one stop, two stop, right? Well, it's kind of the same concept, much more complex than that, but from a visual perspective, it's kind of how it's supposed to work, is that you would go in to the exchange and provide a basic amount of information. Your income, your family members, who your doctor is, and up would come, instead of the airlines, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, United Health Group. And then you would have these four plans, which we call the four precious metals. Bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Bronze covers the least and costs the least. Platinum covers the most and costs the most. And you would see every single plan would say, oh, here's what they offer from a bronze perspective. Well, can I afford that? And then if you were between 133 and 400% of the federal poverty level, and that's $88,000 for a family of four, you get a tax credit that's advanceable and refundable. So it effectively acts like a subsidy where you could go there, take that tax credit, and have more affordable care. That's the concept. It's pretty simple, right? Well, not really. So what this exchange has to do is it's, it's much more than just, you know, orbits is just a nice way to think about it. The orbits, what really has to happen is a lot more. So this exchange has to rate health plans. It has to operate, like orbits, it has to operate a website. It has to operate a hotline. It has to standardize the presentation of coverage options, calculate plan costs. And this is the entity that um, we'll talk about in a little bit with the individual mandate, but this is the entity that will help deem whether or not a person is exempt from the individual mandate. But one of the key features in this is that it has to inform individuals if you're eligible for Medicaid or CHIP, my child in Michigan, and then enroll you. That's different from what we have in Michigan today. Today, you would go to your local DHS office, or you'd go online if you were a child or, or some, some of the adult populations, and you'd be able to enroll in, in, in health care. And the way that the federal government, their intent at least, uh, based on their communications to us at the state level, is that all of this happens real time. So that orbits when you purchase your health care, when you purchase your airfare, it's the same idea. It's a kind of the instant coverage that you would get. That's different from what we have today. And that's a very new concept that requires quite a bit of planning. So, so that's a nice way of saying is there's a ton of work to do on this. So here are our options. We have three options in Michigan. We can do it ourselves. We can join together with other states. Or we can defer to the feds. All three are very viable policy options that have, po that have positives and negatives associated with them from, from a position of control over what's being put on the exchange and from a financial perspective. So, that's the first key decision. If we do it in Michigan, if we decide to establish it ourselves, 
then we have another three options. It could be within state government, a quasi-public authority, kind of like uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation is a quasi-public authority. It's kind of the same concept. Or we can establish it as a new nonprofit away, pushed away from state government entirely. Keep in mind, though, that the interface with government in terms of Medicaid still has to be there because of, you know, Medicaid is a government program. So we are going to have to stay very, very close to the exchange. So this is the fun timeline. We don't even have guidance yet on what an exchange looks like. The feds haven't issued it. And we expect it this spring, but we haven't gotten anything yet. We have a vague idea of things that they want. But they haven't told us a lot of things that are definitive. So we're planning for this. In January 1st, 2014, so two years, nine months, this has to be fully up and operational. But the dirty secret is that a year and nine months from now, the federal government will come in and say, we'll certify whether or not we're, uh, we'll be ready to go on January 1st, 2014. So we have to have the exchange in a place to where we'll be able to be certified in a year and nine months. And think of all the things I talked about, all the things that we have to do. And that's beyond. That's just the mandatory stuff. That doesn't get into the unique dynamics that we have in Michigan and how it interplays with our current programs and our current safety net. There's a lot of that stuff we have to hash out. We don't have a lot of time to do it. In, 20, in January 1st, 2015, another key financing piece of this is the exchange has to be financially self-sustaining. The feds, as you can see by the financing uh, portion right here, the cost to establish the exchange is borne by the federal government. Great, especially in times of tight, bu in, in tight budgets, the feds picking up the tab is, is a very nice thing. Except that when it, as it relates to the interface with Medicaid, because we're gonna have to change how we enroll and how, people, how eligibility is determined for people who are in Medicaid. Our IT systems, we're gonna have to, to chip in about 10% of the cost for that. Now, I don't know if you've been reading the news, but we don't exactly have a lot of money these days. So how are we going to find that right now? And then in 2015, how is this thing going to be financially self-sustaining? And what's that impact then on the marketplace? When you're imposed, you know, depending upon what the financing mechanism is, is it a tax? Is, it a, is the general fund at the state of Michigan going to provide money for it every year? That is a key policy question that we have to answer. And again, we have to do this in a way and in a very quick manner. So here's how we're planning for it. So we've got a million dollars from the feds. And what we've done is we are bringing together stakeholders from across the state, business, labor, consumers, um, you know, seniors groups, um, health providers, the health insurance industry, bringing everyone together and really kind of taking a collective look at what this is and saying, what's best for Michigan? What's best for the state? Working together to try to come up with consolidated recommendations and then we'll obviously present that to the leadership within state government. We're also going to be doing research and data analysis to make sure that we're actually making data-driven decisions so that we know who all is coming into the exchange, who all is coming into Medicaid, what's it going to cost us, how is it, you know, are there people in employer-sponsored insurance today that might drop their coverage and might go into the exchange? What does that mean from a workload perspective for the exchange, for Medicaid, for all these other programs? And then if we're going to establish the exchange, then we're going to um, do a lot more analysis of the plans and of the fiscal sustainability. So I want to go back to Medicaid because it is pretty key. And, and Jenny talked about it a lot, but I, I want to, because you can't de-link, like I said at the very start, you can't de-link these issues because the exchange has a profound effect on Medicaid and Medicaid has a profound effect on the exchange. You can't look at the stuff in a silo. So in 2014, like Ginny had mentioned, uh, Medicaid's expanded to 133% of the federal poverty level. So currently, we cover 1.9 million Michigan residents in Medicaid. We expect an additional 450 to 500,000 uninsured individuals to enroll in Medicaid. And we believe that's our expansion and our kind of our woodwork effect, is, which is people that are currently eligible but unenrolled coming onto the program. It's possible these numbers could change. Because the, the, the ability and the, um, the behavior of employers can help determine a lot of this stuff. 
the Medicaid rates is a great is a, is a great piece. I'm glad Jenny talked about it because basically after two years, our rates in Michigan are about 54 percent of Medicare, very very low. So what happens? And after the federal government, after they give us this cash and we increase our primary care provider rates for to 100 percent of Medicare, and then in two years, poof, the money goes away. Are we going to drop back down to where we are today? Or are we going to hold it at what, we, what it is? Or are we going to hold it at 100%? That's a fundamental policy question that has an enormous fiscal impact on the state. And then like I talked about, all this new enrollment and IT requirements. And that's before you get into, like I had mentioned before, all the payment reforms that are contained in the law that try to bend the cost curve for, med for, for Medicaid. Interjecting all of that together with the exchange, with all the new... The, the, all the new stuff that's contained in the Affordable Care Act for, for employer-sponsored insurance, bringing that all together. It's an enormous task. So here's kind of our challenges. Tight timelines. As you can, as you can imagine, I've tried to explain it, and I hope everyone got it. We are at an enormous time pressure to try to keep pace with federal timelines. Otherwise, a lot of decisions that we make in Michigan might be preempted by the federal government. So we have a, a lot of fundamental policy decisions to make in a, very real, in a relatively short period of time. And then you get into coordination. So the coordination between not only with stakeholders, because you know, everyone knows that everyone in, in the political arena is going to want to have a say in a lot of how this plays out. But then you also have the, the coordination among Medicaid, Medicare, the exchange, and then existing initiatives, things we already do today that might, have, might be impacted in some way or another. I mean, we have programs in Michigan today that are very unique to Michigan. So... How does all this impact it? And do they go away? Do they morph? Do they, are they you know, put on steroids, for lack of a better phrase? We don't know. But you have a very short timeline in order to do it. Funding and financing issues. You know, anyone, like I said, if you've been reading the papers, you understand that states are in a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty big fiscal crunch. And there have been, um, a lot of, there's been a lot of debate on the budget here, here in Michigan. But long term, you know, a lot of this requires a sustained fiscal commitment by the state. How do we afford that and not saddle a lot of debt onto y'all? How, how does all this play out? What do we do? What decisions do we make? The federal financing is nice, and you know, we, we're probably going to talk a little bit about what happens if parts of the law go away or you know, some of the legal challenges about it. But if all this gets defunded and things like that, how does all this play together? And how do you plan for it when you have such a tight time frame? Going back to healthcare workforce capacity, there's a lot of, of stuff in here about coverage. But we don't talk about what happens when people with coverage can't go find a doctor. It's hard for you to find, you know, if you have all the preventive coverage for free and you're able to have all that stuff, that's great. But what happens when you can't go find a primary care physician? Because either rates are too low or because, frankly, Michigan, in particular, is going to have a very large shortage in the next 10 to 20 years of nurses and primary care physicians. How do you address that at the same time? And then again, how do we tailor this to be uniquely Michigan? Because we do have a very unique, we have unique insurance markets, unique insurance providers, unique health care providers. We have unique populations. How do you take all this? It's, you can't make it a one-size-fits-all. And So how do you take it and tailor it? So that it's, it is uniquely Michigan. So that's kind of a, a broad overview um, of what's going on at the state level. As you can tell, I'm not bored. So <laughs> I could use all the help I could get. So um, I, I think we're going to take questions in a little bit. I think we're going to turn it over and talk a little bit about some of the, some of the legal fun. Right, so thank you for having me here. Uh, within an hour of its signing last year, the Affordable Care Act became the subject of high-profile and high-stakes attacks on its constitutionality, and specifically the constitutionality of what's become known as the individual mandate. As of today, five trial courts have weighed in on the merits of that constitutional question. Three have found that the act passes muster. Two have said that it doesn't. The cases have been appealed to four separate courts of appeals, none of which has yet acted. In all likelihood, the Supreme Court is going to hear the case sometime during the next calendar year. So what I'd like to do is to try today to take a step away from all the political posturing over the constitutional challenges to the Affordable Care Act 
and give you a clear sense of what those constitutional challenges are all about. And to do that, it's important to understand what the Affordable Care Act does and to see why it looks the way it does. So to begin with, we've got an enormous practical problem on our hands. We've got roughly 50 million uninsured in this country, and that number is just growing. With that in perspective, about one out of six Americans lacks any kind of health insurance today. So the result of this is that people are dying. The researchers, some researchers at Harvard suggest that about 45,000 people die each year as a result of lack of insurance. Millions more forego needed care, including inexpensive preventive care. And lack of insurance contributes to enormous financial insecurity for millions of Americans. About half of all personal bankruptcies are due, at least in part, to uh, medical uh, debts. So very broadly speaking, there are three ways you might go about fixing this problem. Uh, so first, there's socialized medicine, right? We could be like England. We could make the federal government be the owner of all the hospitals. We could make doctors federal employees. Uh, Americans would be guaranteed access to care on the government's dime. This is obviously a political non-starter. There's a slightly more plausible alternative, which is socialized insurance. This is a single-payer system along the lines of what Canada has. And when, under that, the federal government would act as the insurer for the entire country. This is sort of a, this is what people are talking about when they talk about Medicare for all. This sort of socialized insurance is also a political non-starter. Right? So what we're left with is a solution that would build on this nation's rather elaborate system of private insurance in order to guarantee access for everybody. So to do that, you've got to do three things. Okay? The basic problem with health insurance is affordability, right? People just can't pay for it. They can't afford it. So you've got to find money to cover people who are at the lower end of the income spectrum, right? This is not rocket science. You can do that one of two ways. You can either give them money through subsidies, or you can expand the roles of Medicaid. The Affordable Care Act does both. But that's not enough, right? If you did that, then those with pre-existing conditions or poor health status still couldn't get insurance, right? And that's because private insurers would be insane to accept people with poor health status under their plan. So we also have to compel private insurers to accept any and all applicants, whatever their health status, and prohibit those insurers from charging the unhealthy more for their health insurance. Okay, but even that's still not enough, right? Because as soon as you compel health insurers to accept any and all comers, we get, create another massive problem. Who's going to purchase health insurance? Well, a lot of the healthy people would avoid purchasing health insurance that's priced to reflect the average costs to a consumer, right? They'd prefer to go without than to subsidize somebody else's health care. The very sickest among us, on the other hand, they'll rack up the greatest hospital, they'll, those who expect to rack up the greatest hospital bills, they're going to jump for this readily available insurance that they can't be denied. So very quickly, insurance companies are going to see that their customer base is skewed towards the sickest customers. And they'd have to raise premiums in order to make sure they could cover the medical costs of those unhealthy consumers. Insurance companies, when they raised those costs, would disproportionately drive off yet more healthy consumers, leaving them with an unhealthier customer base, which means they'd have to raise premiums again, which would drive away still more healthy people from the private insurance market. Escalating prices from this kind of adverse selection would make health insurance dramatically more expensive and put it out of the reach of millions. So to ensure universal coverage through a private system of insurance, we've got to solve this adverse selection problem. So the way we do it, we require everyone, however healthy, however sick, to participate in the health insurance system. The Affordable Care Act accomplishes this goal through the individual mandate. It's a requirement that you purchase health insurance or face a tax penalty. None of this, I should say, by the way, is, is particularly controversial, right? This is just meat and potatoes economic theory. Every system of universal coverage about which I'm aware that depends on the private market, and this runs from Germany to Massachusetts, depends on some form of a, an individual mandate in order to make the system work. 
but understanding the way that the Affordable Care Act is structured helps us to understand a few things right off the bat. So for starters, it underscores the stakes of these constitutional challenges. If the individual mandate is unconstitutional, the federal government lacks the power to work through the private market to provide universal health coverage, period. It just couldn't do it. And that, in turn, exposes something extremely strange about the argument over the individual mandate. Congress undoubtedly has the constitutional authority to enact a single-payer plan that covers all Americans. That would just be Medicare for all. It could do it tomorrow if that's what it wanted. Yet the challengers to the health care law insist that the Constitution prohibits Congress from taking the less extreme step of tweaking the private insurance system that we have that's a little weird. More significant still, though, understanding the act and the reason that it has an individual mandate allows us to see that this mandate is not some standalone requirement that Nancy Pelosi inflicted on freedom-loving Americans out of her hatred of personal liberty, right? Instead, it's a critical part of an integrated scheme for providing health insurance to the uninsured. Love it or hate it, it's not superfluous. It's not vindictive. Okay, all that out of the way, we can turn back to the Constitution, okay? The thrust of the legal challenges is simple, right? Congress lacks the constitutional authority to compel individuals to purchase health insurance in the private market. That's it. To assess the force of this challenge, what we've got to do is decide whether the Constitution, in fact, does empower Congress to enact the individual mandate. And so there are three constitutional provisions that bear on that question that I want to talk to you about today. So first, there's the Commerce Clause, and this has received by far the most attention in the press. Commerce Clause authorizes Congress to directly regulate economic activity that substantially affects interstate commerce. Okay, so everybody agrees that the healthcare market is interstate, and that the choice to purchase healthcare insurance, right, has a substantial effect on that market. That's common ground. The big fight is over whether the decision not to purchase health insurance can be classified as economic activity. If it is, Congress can regulate it via the Commerce Clause. If it's not, they can't. Now, the challengers to the individual mandate argue that those who decline to purchase insurance aren't engaging in economic activity. Instead, they say, refusing to buy insurance is a choice to opt out of the healthcare market. It's the opposite of economic activity. And they have a point, right? If I choose not to buy an apple or a car, it's hard to see how that choice is economic activity. But this argument has considerably less traction when we're talking about health care. So now, if you decline to buy health insurance, you might think you've exempted yourself from the health care market. But if you break your leg, or if you have a heart attack, you're going to the emergency room. And the hospital's going to treat you, whether or not you have insurance. None of us, as a practical matter, has the luxury of opting out of a medical care system that can literally save our lives. So refusing to buy insurance is tantamount to making a choice about how and when you're going to pay for health care. Either you're going to prepay for it via insurance, or you're going to wait until you get hurt and hope that you can cover your medical expenses. Now, in the government's view, and the government is defending this statute, the choice of when and how to pay is just an economic decision, no different than many of the daily economic decisions that all of us make. And it gets worse than that. As it turns out, many people who decline to purchase insurance can't cover the costs of the health care that they eventually accrue. And the costs of providing that health care to the uninsured is then passed along to those of us who do pay for insurance. So the choice not to buy insurance expresses a kind of willingness to impose costs on those who have. And that, too, makes this decision look an awful lot like an economic choice. Now, let's say you disagree with all of that. You think, OK, no, 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 this is definitely economic inactivity. It's beyond the reach of the Commerce Clause. That fight has received by far the most attention, but it is not actually where the real constitutional action is. There's another constitutional provision that looms significantly larger in this litigation. It's 
called the Necessary and Proper Clause. And this empowers Congress to take any necessary and proper steps to carry out its enumerated powers, including its Commerce Clause powers. And there's a hoary rule of constitutional law, going back to Chief Justice Marshall in the 19th century, that where Congress has the power to enact a regulation of interstate commerce, it possesses every power needed to make that regulation effective. Now, everybody agrees that the Commerce Clause authorizes Congress to prohibit most forms of medical underwriting in the private insurance market. And as I explained at the outset, the regulation of the national market for health care would be ineffective unless Congress can also prohibit people from opting out of that health insurance market. So in the government's view, this is a really easy case. The individual mandate is a necessary and proper means of executing unenumerated power. And that's so even if the decision not to purchase health insurance is not economic in nature. It doesn't matter if it's economic activity or not. The individual mandate is necessary and proper to carry out the guaranteed uh, eligibility requirements of the Affordable Care Act. So now what do the challengers to the, the individual mandate say to all this? Well, this is where their argument is at its very shakiest. They argue that the mandate is not proper within the meaning of the necessary and proper clause because it does not, quote, consist with the spirit of the Constitution. What's the legal basis for this argument? Well, there really isn't one. I don't mean that necessarily in a pejorative fashion. Um, there's no, so the one thing we know is there's no deeply embedded principle in the federal constitution that prohibits the government from acting upon individuals, right? The federal government can draft you, can make you serve on a jury, can force you to file a tax return. Now, the challengers nonetheless firmly believe that the structure of our Constitution prohibits the federal government from acting directly upon individuals in this fashion, from commandeering the people, to borrow their phrase. The trouble is that the strength of their conviction doesn't transform it into a constitutional prohibition. Now, they instead have to convince the courts, and in particular the Supreme Court, that this conviction rests on something fundamental about our constitutional values. And this is a heavy lift. Right? Reasonable people can differ about whether the individual mandate is an intolerable incursion on personal liberties or if whether it's instead a necessary and modest component of a plan to cover the uninsured. And typically, the Supreme Court will defer to Congress on value questions like that. Which is why, if the Supreme Court were to read this conviction into the Constitution, it would be an unbelievably radical step. And it would forever reshape the relationship between the states and the federal government. Now, even if you disagreed with all this and you thought, forget it, that still doesn't get off the ground. The Constitution also authorizes Congress to lay and collect taxes for the general welfare. The Supreme Court has held that this power is virtually without limitation. And here, the government's arguing that this mandate is just a tax. It's a tax on your choice not to purchase health insurance. And typically, courts aren't disposed to look too hard at arguments about the constitutionality of taxes. This argument is probably where the government's case is at its weakest. Uh, if for no other reason than both Congress and the President spent a considerable amount of time arguing that the individual mandate was not a tax because that was politically a challenge. And there's moreover something unseemly about allowing Congress to enact a substantive law through the taxing power that it couldn't have enacted pursuant to several other powers. Um, so again, that's where the government's case is probably at its weakest, but it's another alternative possibility. The bottom line here, however, for our purpose, is that, is that there are three separate arguments that, th three separate constitutional provisions that arguably support the constitutionality of the mandate. In order to strike the mandate down, a court's got to find both of the, I mean, it's got to find three things. It's got to find that the decision not to purchase insurance is economic inactivity. It's got to find that it's improper to require people to purchase insurance, improper in some constitutional sense. And it's got to find that the taxing power can't support the mandate. It's got to do all three. And that's a tall order. And that's why when these cases were filed, it was, for most commentators, unthinkable that the Supreme Court would ever take the extraordinarily activist step to strike down the most significant social legislation in 50 years. I want to close by pointing out, though, that over the past year, something has changed. 
And that's something that's instructive about how constitutional change in our country occurs. It's in part because of decisions striking down the mandate from two district courts. And what's happened is that over the past year, the unthinkable has slowly become, well, kind of thinkable. No legal doctrine has changed. There's been no intervening Supreme Court decision. But the mood of the country has shifted in ways that are difficult to define, but they're very hard to ignore. And this matters a lot to constitutional analysis. I want to remind you of what happened over the past two decades with respect to the right to bear arms. In 1991, Chief Justice Berger called the argument that there was an individual right to carry arm, to bear arms, he called that the biggest fraud he'd ever seen perpetrated on the American public. He used the word fraud. Two decades later, the Supreme Court embraced that fraud. We're watching the same thing happen now on a much more compressed time frame. The individual mandate is significantly less secure than it was just 12 months ago. The odds are still that the Supreme Court upholds the legislation. I'd be willing to bet on that. But things change, and things are changing. I wouldn't bet the farm. So um, while we're collecting the cards, maybe I'll, I'll start with a, a question of my own. Um, Nick, you did a nice job of, of summarizing the, the economics of the reforms and, and how the mandate fits in. Um, and I think each of you probably has thought a lot about this. Uh, I wonder if, if, if you could each take a minute to, um, to describe, if there is one, sort of the arguments or, or the, the proposals that critics would have if you were to strike the mandate how would we achieve some of the things that are very popular in the bill? Because the, the underwriting reforms, I think, have pretty broad uh, appeal. Um, when people are just, you know, asked, what do you think about a law that says insurance companies can't discriminate? Um, there's pretty broad support, but as you mentioned, it's very problematic. So I don't know if each of you could talk about, have, have conservatives proposed an alternative? Um, I'll just say that there's no alternative that's been proposed um, that would achieve anywhere near the uh, reduction in uninsurance in this country. So I, I think um, taking off the table um, the options that Nick mentioned in terms of socialized medicine or socialized insurance, um, if you take away the mandate, I think the uh, best projections are that the, un that the uninsured will still decline, uh, but by a lot less. Um, you know, from my perspective, it depends on if, say, portions of the law were struck down. I mean, from our perspective in Michigan is, you know, we're complying with federal law, and as the law changes, we'll change with it. Um, or, it, you know, because uh, we all assume that there might be some tweaks. There already are being some that have been implemented in Congress. So I guess if the court takes action, the question is, is what's left? And then, frankly, at that point, Congress either has to figure out something else or it's up to the states. And then, then the question is, is, OK, what's available to us? So if you strike down the individual mandate, how, do you, how are you able to achieve the you know, guaranteed issue assumably would go with it? So then the question is, is well, are there other mechanisms? There are not a lot that have been out there that have been proposed. I mean, high risk pools have been something that have been tried in a, in a number of states. But that, uh, there are still a lot of folks that have been discriminated against in those states with pre-existing conditions. And like I had mentioned earlier with the experience we have currently in Michigan, Premiums are still pretty high. So then the question is, is well, what's next? So what's the next solution that we come up with? And, and frankly, that's something I think everyone is thinking through. It's just, just no one has come up with the silver bullet yet for what the states could do. So I, I think I would answer the question by, by asking a, a hard remedial question, which is assume you think the individual mandate is unconstitutional. <laughs> you can either strike out the mandate and keep the rest of the law intact. That's one approach. Or the courts could say, you know, the individual mandate is part and parcel of how this legislation works. 
kind of strike down the whole thing because I can't be sure what Congress would have done had it known that this was unconstitutional. Um, different district courts, the two different district courts that have struck down the mandate have gone different directions on that. So one just excised the mandate, one struck down the whole legislation. Um, if you just got rid of the mandate, I think we'd probably see spiraling insurance costs very quickly. Whether that would prompt any kind of political response is open to question. Um, it's hard with the gridlock in Washington today to see exactly how the parties are going to move together constructively to deal with the problem um, of a law that doesn't look like anybody really expected it to look. If the whole law goes by the wayside, um, then I think it's up to the states. And I think you're going to see a lot of uh, efforts like Massachusetts to come forward with uh, comprehensive medical care for their citizens. Vermont is talking a lot about it. Um, and you're going to see more proposals like that floated. Uh, I don't think the federal government's going to have any room to move, at least for the next decade or two. So it, but it's interesting, though, because, you know, we've had several uh, waves of attempted state reform, and, and there's a real limit to what states can do. I guess Massachusetts was able to, to work it out, but they were starting from a fairly strong base in terms of high rates of coverage, and, um, and, and a lot of what they did had to sort of jerry-rig a system uh, to get federal subsidies through, you know, uh, Section 125. And, uh, I don't think that deal's available. I think that deal's off the table for other states. Um, and Vermont, like Massachusetts, is starting so far ahead yeah. of other states. And there are problems. There's a statute called ERISA that makes it extraordinarily right. difficult for states to freelance uh, in the healthcare environment. ERISA preempts most state laws that, relect, uh, that relate to employer-sponsored insurance. Um, the details are complicated, but it makes even the plan in Massachusetts pretty dodgy. And it's hard to see how you get a, get a plan off the ground without directly regulating employers, which is verboten. So it's, a, it's an enormously tricky problem. So the one district court that struck the whole law down, so the Medicaid expansion would go everything. to everything. 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 Whether that's provisions requiring employers to provide time for lactating mothers to pump, or whether chain restaurants should post calorie counts. Okay. Things that have nothing to do with health insurance are all out the window. Can you, uh, is that okay, or? Well, I think we, recording. yeah, we, oh, need, we oh. need the mics on to. Those, those microphones are just for the recording, they're not for the house amplification. But, but you're getting it. Oh, you are getting it. So yeah. can you hear us in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well then in that case, I, we won't worry about it. <laughs> there, we, thank you, no, 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 no. We have some other questions on the, um, uh, the financing, but, but there's just one follow-up question somebody asked on the, um, the legal issues, and, and the question is, is there a chance that the Supreme Court will not rule at all, will not take the case? Yeah, there is. So if all of the circuit courts uphold the statute, and, and there's a shot at that, then the Supreme Court might uh, be a little gun-shy and might just decline to hear the case. Um, if I had to put odds on it, I, say, I would say that the odds of all the circuit courts agreeing and the Supreme Court declining nonetheless to take the case are pretty low, but it's a, it's a possibility. I think they're going to want to hear this case. I think it's important to have an institution like the court resolve an issue that has fractured the American people in this way, and I think that's how they'll perceive it. But I could be wrong. Um, changing gears a little bit to talking about the, the relationship between the federal government and the states, um, we talked about that a little bit in terms of the, the, the way the dollars are split. And um, the question we have here is that the administration has indicated that it may be increasingly flexible as to what states must do, um, is it possibly motivated by political pressure? Uh, how, how would this affect Michigan's planned implementation? And I guess sort of my add-on question is, is, when people talk about flexibility, can you speak to what are the things that you would find most valuable in terms of flexibility? Uh, what are the things that, that are sort of high on the list of what the sure. feds would grant? Well, uh, I assume that there's something that's been out there that the administration has proposed. It's something that's in the law currently called state innovation waivers. That basically says, if you can come up with a better alternative, come up with it. And the Obama administration has proposed moving that up to 2014. When it comes to waivers, the devil is always in the details. It is, it's one of those things where, okay, they, they've said, it, it's, and it's actually in the law, that you, know, you have to meet certain benchmarks if you're able to achieve the flexibility. You have to achieve the same goals as the Affordable Care Act does, at the same levels the Affordable Care Act does. You have to be federal budget deficit neutral. 
So you can't spend more money than the federal government otherwise would have taken. So the question is, is if Michigan decided to come up with something, something unique and we're exploring, and, and to be totally frank, we're exploring all options. I mean, we're looking at kind of, again, we want something that's very uniquely Michigan and addresses our unique needs. So if we were to go to them, the question is, is how would we negotiate that with the federal government and how flexible are they willing to be in the terms and conditions that they would impose on us to achieve that flexibility? When it comes to the, the things that we would like, I mean, man, that, I mean, where do I start? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that a lot of states, the lot of states would like. I mean, flexibility when it comes to financing, a lot of this stuff is always very good, especially as it relates to waivers, um, things where we want to be able to do things that the federal government, you know, currently says you should need to do it one way. We ask to do it another. They be a little giving when it comes to some of the financing issues. Um, you know, maybe as it relates to who all goes into the exchange, who all goes into Medicaid. I mean, there's 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 a lot of things that states could, that that a state could ask for. We're exploring all of them, frankly. I mean, because you can't just limit your point of view. Because again, the way that we're approaching this is, you know, taking a look at the the whole, not just a portion of the whole. So it it really depends on the specific issue that you're looking at. There is a lot. There is a, on the exchange. You know, they do have a lot of things that say you have to do it this way. You have to, you know, you have to do it that way. But there's a lot of flexibility in how we can design it. You know, we can say we want it to be, you know for lack of a better phrase, and orbits for healthcare and let everybody into the marketplace if we want. We have the ability to act more, the exchange can have the ability to act more like Medicaid and actually be more of an active purchaser or a selective contractor and actually actually have public policy decisions driven through the purchasing mechanisms of the exchange. So it depends on, a lot of, a lot of it depends on the decisions that we make and the order that we make them in. And at that point, that's kind of when you say, okay, we'll go to the feds. We might need to ask for a little flexibility here. I mean, it really is. It's so specific to exactly what you're doing on any given day. And this stuff's so broad that it's, you know, who knows? But, Chris, the Obama administration proposed moving that, those, that waiver authority mm -hmm. forward, but doesn't that take Congress? It takes Congress to do it. Okay, and to next point, um, it's not clear to me that this Congress will agree on any changes to this bill. Right. Uh, or beyond what they've already. But it, but it still doesn't deny the fact that, twenty you know right now these, the, the state innovation waiver is going to effect in twenty seventeen, so there's still something out in the time and yeah. the horizon. Oh yeah, no, no, that no. we could do. Yeah. And it's just a matter of what is it and what is it that makes it's best for Michigan citizens. So, that's a a, po a public policy question that we're going to have to solve at some point or another, and again. Depending upon what that is, is all the devil's always in the details when it comes to waivers because it's really a negotiation with the federal government. And like with the Massachusetts example about when, if you if the states had to go to the federal government one by one, you know it's hard to see whether or not we'd get the same deal as Massachusetts got, or whether we get the same deal California just got, or whether we get the same deal. It really depends on kind of what we're doing with how what the federal government is willing to to be flexible about. And like I said, the devil's always in the details. I think it depends on who your governor is, too. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I follow up on that? Um, actually, this is a question that came from the audience. Um, you know, this issue of, of tailoring it to the to the, the specific situation in the state. You know, I realize that as you're implementing this, um, you know, the population of Michigan is very heterogeneous, and lots of people have different needs. Yeah. I'm trying to get a better handle on how Michigan differs from other states and what might be unique to Michigan that would lead you to, to go in a certain direction on any one of these angles that, that sure. say, you know, Ohio or Indiana would, would take a different route? Well, um, a, a unique thing about the state is that we have a unique insurance market. We have, a, um, we have the insurance code in the state of Michigan, and we also have something that's known as PA350 that governs the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, which is a nonprofit that is required to be the payer of last resort, effectively Anyone that needs coverage, whether they have a pre-existing condition or not, can go to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan today and get coverage. The, then the question is, is, can you afford it? So we do have unique systems in Michigan that a lot of the Affordable Care Act preempts, frankly. We, have ver we don't have a lot of rules and regulations and rating requirements in the individual market. That changes. So with guaranteed issue where you have one insurer already who has to be a payer of last resort and now everyone is a payer of last resort, 
what does that mean for the insurance code? How, did the, how, how does the insurance industry in Michigan morph to comply with, with, with the new mandates in the Affordable Care Act? It's a very key policy question. It's something that's very unique to Michigan. We're the only state that has this, this kind of unique hybrid structure. Uh, or I should say we're one of the only states. There are, very, uh, there are a couple others, I think. But yeah, maybe New York. But New York, I think New York. Well, New York is a guaranteed issue. But yeah. Generally, not just yeah. Yeah. Um, also, on the general issue of, of variation across states, uh, Michigan is a state that's been very proactive in terms of gearing up and, and preparing. Can, can the three of you speak to other states that maybe have um, not moved as quickly, either uh, for ideological reasons or, or for lack of capacity? Um, do you have a sense of, of are, are there states that are, are waiting this out? I think two states uh, didn't take the feds up on their offer to fund the um, exchange uh, planning, Alaska and Minnesota. With the new governor in Minnesota, I think they said, wait a minute, we, we, I think that's how that works. Um, we'd like that money. Um, but across the country, you know, I, I live in Virginia, and that's a state that's very aggressively uh, litigating um, the um, the uh, constitutionality of the act, and yet uh, they are implementing just as Michigan is saying. We're challenging it's the, it as well. It's the letter of the law. It's the law of the land. We're going to implement. There are other states. Um, I think, especially in the South and and some um, out uh, in the Northwest, um, that are not uh, actively. Um, implementing um, to the extent that other states are. But uh, the sense I have is that most states are moving ahead because they don't want to be caught um, way behind the curve should this um, proceed as planned. Yeah. I think a lot of states are taking, including Michigan, are taking a very pragmatic approach to this, that we're planning, and as the law changes, we'll change with it. So, the, the you know, we don't want to be caught flat-footed, and if we want to make with decisions that for here in Michigan that are best for Michigan residents, we want to try to address those. But at the same time, that you know, you know, Michigan is a part of one of the lawsuits, and you know, and there are, are, are those in the state who, who will fight the who will fight the law vigorously and stuff, and you know, and that's all fair. So it, it really depends. It, it really is a state by state thing. I, I I know of states just in the Midwest that are further ahead than us and the Michigan, and then are very very far behind from us. So it, it really is, it's a case-by-case -case basis, depending upon where you sit. The Florida court's decision striking down the entirety of the act threw kind of a curveball into a lot of states' sort of decision-making about how aggressively to proceed, uh, in part because it didn't first address the force of its opinion that left unclear whether he was entering an injunction against implementation of the act nationwide. And so the federal government actually filed a motion with the court saying, uh, what, what did you do? Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty much... <laughs> no, uh, that's Wait, actually what? like what the brief pretty much said. Um, and the district court declined to impose a nationwide injunction, saying that seems to be a little bit uh, beyond what I'm empowered to do, I think appropriately so. Um, and the decision has now been appealed, and so things are sort of back where they were, which is that the law still exists, but who knows how much longer that's going to be the case. A couple of minutes left, um, got a lot of good questions, so I'll just try to, to pick through. Let me change gears a little bit. Um, you know, a sector that's going to be uh, impacted um, significantly by reform or not reform is uh, health care providers, and because that wasn't what you were asked to, to speak on, we haven't talked a lot about that, but um, uh, one questioner asked very, very, um, Succinctly, where are physicians in all of this? Will we see our compensation go down? <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors for who answers. <laughs> um, you want to do it or you want to? I'll, I'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would. I bet you, would. Um, I, you know, I, I think that when it comes, in particular with Medicaid, we know that we're going to, that uh, physicians, for pr primary care physicians in particular, are going to see their rates increase in 13 and 14. But again, it goes back to that planning question and what I had talked about the long-term challenges in terms of financing is what happens afterwards? And then what happens to the private insurance market when you have a lot of more people in Medicaid and a lot of kind of this, you know, the theme is, is that if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. So states are going to be doing lots of different things with, when it comes to provider rates. So the question then becomes, okay, well, 
if we're going to increase rates for two years, then what do we do with the financing? Are we going to drop it back down to where it is today? And in Michigan, like I said earlier, it's about 54%. Or do we come up with a financing mechanism to try to keep it at those at those rates? And like I said, I, I think everyone here is aware of the budget challenges that, that we're currently undergoing. But that that goes into what's going to happen next. What's the private market's going to reaction going to be to a lot of this stuff? And we don't know yet. And it's it's frankly just uh, we we aren't we aren't there yet. We're not sure. We're evaluating it and studying it and trying to prepare for it the best we can. But the we just it, it, there's there's no good answer at this moment because the effect of a lot of what's in ACA hasn't taken effect yet. Is that fair? Yeah, I th and I think it's a nice way of saying I have no idea. <laughs> Um, and, and I think there's, um, it, it's likely that on average providers will be paid more in the exchange plans, yeah, um, but that's an unknown. Um, and um, while the pie, the medical spending pie is going to get bigger, um, I don't know that physicians down the road are going to get a bigger chunk of that. I mean, you could see more rationalization in terms of use of mid-levels. and. Um, it also it also depends on the kind of physician. Kind of physician's I mean, huge. I mean, if yeah. you're if you're gonna you know there's a, a strong emphasis right now, and including in, in Michigan, you know uh, you know the governor has a very clear and stated goal about encouraging prevention, wellness, and personal responsibility, and a lot of that is embedded you know in, in certain things that, that we're that we're doing, but you know they're also you know we're like I said with the increases in Medicaid, those are for, for primary care physicians. What about specialists? Those who you know a lot of whom may work at the University of Michigan Health System. So what happens to, to a lot of that? So it really depends on, on where you sit. And there is a, a huge focus on preventive care. So are, you, are someone going into that, into that general practice, or are they going to be you know, doing something very specific? I think it, it really depends. T taking a very big step back, the ACA is really good on coverage, and really good on access to care. It doesn't do a whole lot directly to bend the cost curve, although I think it plants the seeds for potentially down the line effective cost control mechanisms, which is that that is often lost in the debate. That is a critical feature of the act. It, it's not it's not at all insignificant that there are trying that there are a ton of demonstration projects that are getting underway. There's a ton of latitude to implement those demonstration projects should they prove effective. Um, in terms of squeezing doctors, I think they've been squeezed because the economics of it are such that people are trying to pull money from whoever they can.